Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Doth Protest, a, a podcast on Reformation history and theology. And we are very blessed today to have a leading Reformation scholar joining us, uh, Dr. Robert Kolb. Um, I, it's he's done so much that I can't don't even know how to really introduce him without it, it's really having to pick out pick what choose what to leave out so I don't um, go on forever. But he's written so much and. Um, some of the books that you may have seen his name on, for one, he's probably perhaps most notably known for the uh, a commonly used uh, edition of Book of Concord published in 2000 he, that he edited and and uh, translated with uh, Timothy Wanger. But he's also written uh, a number of books on Luther, uh, including The Genius of Luther's Theology in 2008, uh, Martin Luther, Confessor of the Faith in 2009. Uh, Luther and the Stories of God in 2012, and Luther's Wittenberg World in 2018, and that's just uh, some of the many books he's written, and he's contributed to many, um, many other books as editor. He's written many articles. Uh, he is the professor uh, emeritus of systematic theology at Concordia St. Louis, which uh, he retired from several years ago, and, he, and uh, he taught there for 16 years. And prior to that, he had uh, other uh, teaching positions uh, where he taught on uh, topics of Reformation and theology. So, Dr. Kolb, thanks for, for being on the show. It's a pleasure, Drew. And we've met before because we, um, I took, I was, uh, had the privilege of doing a class under you, Dr. Kolb, at Institute of Lutheran Theology, which you will teach courses that time to time. I don't even remember the name of that course. I had a long title, I remember enjoying it, but it was something along two kingdoms was somewhere in the title. I think that's what drew me in. Um, yeah, but uh, it was very enjoyable. And uh, basically, a, a course on the third article of the creed on sanctification. And yeah. yeah, and and what was particularly interesting about that, and what I learned so much from from the students, uh, you guys were in the midst of Corona. Mm -hmm. No, we fell into Corona during the semester. We started at the end of January in 2020. Yeah, I do yeah. remember that. It was um, oh, such a strange time. And uh, as back when it was actually called Corona, gosh, that, that was, um, it, it, then it became, of course, COVID. The people was called COVID. Yeah, yeah I remember that was, um, and uh, we didn't know what was, things were changing by the day. And, and a lot of us yeah. in the class, um, I know before we, I uh, had before we recorded, I, we, you and I had a conversation about or I, I, I told you how much I appreciated um, that, you know, a lot of us in that class were in in parish ministry. And so that was you gave us time in the class to really just uh, <laughs> process <laughs> what was going on because it was very needed. Um, so thank you for that. It was um, that was just one of many things I enjoyed about the class. So, yeah. yeah. And you are currently in. uh Germany and and you've t taken many trips to Germany and um and you're you're in Mainz I'm sorry in Mainz mm -hmm. Mainz yep well actually um the French influence is strong here because it was part of Napoleon's France uh during the during the period right in the 1790s early 1800s so we say we also say Mainz here but uh, Mainz is the official pronunciation Yes. And uh, now I know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and James, of course, uh, he, you're with me. To, you're with us today, too. So how are you doing? I'm well. I'm, I'm particularly excited about this episode. I've been looking forward to it for a while. Uh, even though I'm an Episcopalian, I actually have it on my list of things to do to read through the Book of Concord, as I've been deeply influenced by Luther. Um, so I, Drew and I uh, are kindred spirits with, with you, Dr. Kolb, in the sense that we are um, Lutheran Anglicans. So, yeah. yes. And um, of course, speaking of Luther, we he has come up a lot on the show. His face is featured on our podcast artwork as well as, well as with some other, uh, I guess you could call them major figures of the Reformation. But um, this episode, we, um, you know, nobody in history uh, accomplishes things by themselves. Uh, and so the, the point of this episode is to delve into some several other people who, um, with the exception of Philip Melanchthon, have probably not 
been brought up on this show for for any reason or we haven't had the um, opportunity to um but today is an opportunity that, that we have uh, dr colban who can tell us a little bit about um these people so i guess i'll start this out with with uh basically saying you know luther he had a team behind him or not behind him but alongside him and um a lot of these mm-hmm. it, people were uh, associated with him uh, via the University of Wittenberg. And so I guess, uh, Dr. Cope, can you tell us a little bit about um, what kind of school was Wittenberg? Why was, um, obviously we know Luther has a history with that university and he, and, um, but, but I guess what, what was a unique characteristic about this place that it happened to generate these minds of, of, of these individuals who we'll be talking about? It was, it was a very young university. Uh, German universities go back into the 14th century, actually. Um, and there was a, a, a the founding of three or four important universities in the 1480s, 1490s. Um, but then after uh, the 16th century, the turn of the 16th century, there was another wave of, uh, or maybe the continuation of that wave, of founding of universities. They were important for um, early modern or late medieval monarchs because they needed to train, uh, especially uh, lawyers, but also clergy and um, and medical doctors uh, for their own territories. And so having a university was a matter of prestige. You had to get the approval of, of the Pope or the emperor or both, preferably. And so the... Um, the Duke of Saxony, who served as one of the electors of the German M- Empire, of, of, there were seven men who chose the the emperor. Uh, Frederick the Wise uh, founded his university in 1502, and, and Luther was sent there uh, at the end of that decade, actually, and began teaching, and, and he moved to Wittenberg permanently in 1511. So it was a young faculty. That meant it had flexibility. And what's often ignored is that uh, it not only was a hot spot for theological discussion, um, one of its professors, a man named Valerius Valor- uh, Corda, um, took, took his students in his botany class uh, into the woods and ma- started education by field trips for um, at least for the discipline of botany. Uh, in um, particularly in astronomy, uh, there were a couple of professors, um, uh, Radicus and Reinhold, who furthered the publication of, uh, really brought the publication of uh, Copernicus's work on the uh, revolution of the spheres uh, into print. And uh, although at least Reinhardt, didn't really believe in this silly theory about the the relationship of the sun and the and the earth, because uh, everybody can see that the sun rises and sets, so it's got to be going around the earth. Hmm. But he did use um, Copernicus's calculations. I think Radicus probably really believed uh, Copernicus when he said that the the earth revolves around the sun, but he was uh, nobody else did it at at the time. But they used Copernicus calculations. So um, uh, also in in Latin poetry, uh, there there were a number of important authors, uh, Melanchthon and and a couple of colleagues really began the the formal lectures on history as a part of the university. Uh, So it was a lively place. And all these people fed into Luther and and, um, and Luther was interested in this widespread of disciplines as were his colleagues in the theological faculty. So uh, so I think the flexibility of a new university, able to experiment, and particularly uh, able to take on what we now label a biblical humanism, uh, an educational reform movement that uh, stressed going back to the original languages for law for medicine, Galen was read, for instance, um, going back to Roman law, 
Uh, and then the theological texts in Hebrew and Greek, not in, in the Latin translation. Uh, and then the, the, these biblical humanists also emphasized uh, the importance of rhetoric, uh, communication theory, and, and Philip Melanchthon's uh, textbooks on, on rhetoric and dialectic or logic uh, continued to be used in, in um, not only in German-speaking lands, but beyond, in, because they were written in Latin for the most part. Uh, mm -hmm. and they were all written in Latin. Um, they, they were used uh, across Europe uh, into the 18th century. Wow. Mm. So it sounds like a you know, kind of the maybe an early form of what is later called the interdisciplinary approach. Perhaps you saw some of that in the Wittenberg setting. Um, yes, uh, at least you had conversation between the disciplines, and and Luther was interested in these things as were Melanchthon particularly. Yeah, and uh, sounds like science too. Uh, maybe the first science lab. Uh, <laughs> I remember taking yeah. both my undergrad. I actually took a. Uh, I had to take two natural sciences. So I took geology and astronomy because they seemed the easiest and maybe the most interesting. I found out that yeah. wasn't the case for astronomy because <laughs> as fascinating as planets are, physics is not my forte. But um, but the labs helped, you know, getting out of the seat and, uh, you know, engaging uh, in more ways than sitting and taking in or, always, you know, <laughs> is good pedagogy. Um, yeah. So... Um, so it's more than it's, it was more than just a theological enterprise going there, but it sounds like um, so with uh, but speaking of the theological enterprise, obviously, this is the place that uh, Luther was associated with and kind of just get a landscape um, for it, because I don't think we've really gone into, you know, we've gotten snippets of biographical details of Luther here and there throughout different episodes we've done on the podcast. But what is um, Luther's relationship with Wittenberg, because you have a church there um, that he's buried in along alongside Melanchthon, and you have um, the university. Um, what are the sites in Wittenberg that are, I guess, today, if you were to take a Reformation tour, you know, are the are the Luther sites, I guess, and and why are they Luther sites? I think it's important to remember that you can go from the the West Gate to the east gate um, in 15 to 20 minutes. So maybe a mile, but maybe a little bit short of that, a little over a kilometer. Um, and, and that's the main street. And then there's a kind of triangle that goes off from this main street. Uh, but it was a, it was a fairly small town. In, in an hour, you can certainly walk around uh, the parameters of what what was Wittenberg in those days. Um, and it it was not a particularly important town, but it did have at the west end of town uh, a, a castle, one of three castles of these Dukes of Saxony that served as electors of the German Empire. So there were, there were bureaucrats there. Uh, and other than that, it was just a small market town um, until the university came. And then all of a sudden, a, a town of about 2,000 people would ha would almost double in size uh, occasionally in, in a semester. Um, so today, if I were taking a tour, I, I would start at the East End because that's where the Augustinian cloister was. Okay. And uh, uh, the the two cloisters there was also a franciscan cloister and uh and lectures were held in these buildings as well as one uh, building that was sort of the university uh and and that's where uh, the augustinian cloister is where luther lived and when um, he got married in 1525 uh, he was practically the only uh, brother augustinian brother left and so the elector gave him the the, the house, and he uh, lived there with his family, and sometimes upwards of forty guests um, or students who were living there um, for a semester, for a year, for a couple of years. Uh, so th there you begin with the university uh, and and Luther's house, and and almost next door is Melanchthon's home. 
uh, that was built for him by the elector. The elector knew that he was from southern Germany and didn't like the northern German climate. And uh, it was out in the wilderness, uh, almost beyond civilization. Uh, there was actually quite a bit of German-speaking territory yeah, further east, but uh, it wasn't really uh, where where you'd want to live. Mm -hmm. And then as you go down the street, you come to um, uh, finally the, the town square. And there is the town church, the Church of St. Mary, and the, the town hall. And uh, across the street, uh, two buildings owned by Lucas Cranach. We'll talk a little bit later maybe about Lucas Cranach, who was a very important part of Luther's team. He mm -hmm. was the uh, court artist, the town's um, druggist. A pharmacist uh, started a printing venture and was very close to Luther. Um, uh, did woodcuts and uh, for his publications, uh, did altars that reflected his theology. And then, if we uh, go further down the street, we come to the castle and the castle church. Okay. And then, if we if we go to the top of the triangle, that's where the Franciscan. Uh, cloister was and that's been restored just in recent years and has a has a really fine presentation of uh, Wittenberg history before Luther so it's very easy to spend a couple of days in, in Wittenberg yeah sounds like it um the church the castle church you mentioned um which by the way the listeners can't see see this because this is only an audio podcast but I I took it. I've been to Concordia St. Louis one time in, in my life and I went to the bookstore and I bought this coin uh, with uh, the castle church on it. I was just mm -hmm. looking at it as you were talking about the castle church. And of course, if you want to visit Luther's tomb yeah. uh, for listeners and a lot of y'all may know that that's where him and Melanchthon are buried. Now, he, Luther was from what I've read, he was like an the equivalent the equivalent of like what an associate pastor would be today perhaps of that church who yes. was the main person i guess and this could be a good way to kind of start talking about some of these slightly lesser known individuals um yeah uh that's an excellent place to start because if we acknowledge that philip melanchthon was sort of the second person of the team and 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 an original thinker in his own right next to luther the um the history of, of Luther's interaction with that parish church goes back to his first days as an Augustinian uh, brother. He went to teach at the university, but the Augustinians were, were called uh, the ordained um, August call to, to help local parish priests uh, with confession, with hearing confession and uh, with preaching. And so Luther began to preach, and he was a good preacher. Uh, his sermons, uh, the first sermons we have from him, are pretty much in the medieval style. And and after a decade or so, by the around the year 1520, his preaching style, as well as its content, changed a little bit, at least. Yeah, I would say significantly. Um, so uh, he he's he was helping uh, an elderly priest whose brother actually was chancellor of the government of Frederick the Wise, uh, he was helping him with preaching. Uh, and then uh, he died, the parish priest, and um, one of the young students who had come from um, on the Baltic coast, a man named Johannes Bugenhagen, uh, was called as pastor. He had, he had been a student. And uh, so he served as pastor then until his death in 1558. And Luther would preach for him. Um, Bugenhagen's, among Bugenhagen's contributions to the team was the fact that he uh, left Wittenberg, sometimes uh, for longer periods of time, to uh, help churches organize. He wrote church ordinances for the cities of Hamburg. Liebeck and Braunschweig and a number of others in northern Germany, as well as for the uh, entire dukedom of Pomerania, uh, from which he had come, and the kingdom of Denmark. He spent a couple years in Denmark, 
uh, Luther started to complain that he was getting tired of, of, of doing all the preaching. He didn't <laughs> do all the preaching because there were several deacons who, who also uh, served uh, in the in the town church. Uh, but their relationship was very close. Bugenhagen and uh, Luther uh, went through the death of children together um, and all sorts of crises in, in the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And so Bugenhagen's parish experience mm -hmm. re reflects the fact that theology was a very practical discipline then as it is now. Uh, and and that he easily combined uh, lecturing on on one of the biblical books uh, each week with his his parish duties. Um, and Bugenhagen, so he he survived uh, Luther, and I've heard that he um, was kind of looked after uh, Luther's family after mm -hmm. Luther died. Yes. Um, Okay. The yeah the, the 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 five members of the theological faculty were really very good friends. Uh, Kaspar mm -hmm. Kruziger was the younger one; he had been their student, but he still was was uh, part of the group after he came uh, in the late fifteen twenties to teach, after serving as a school rector in Magdeburg, actually, and uh, so their families. The kids played together. Mm -hmm. uh, the The wives were friends. Uh, there's a, a occasional talk among scholars that Melanchthon's wife was jealous of Katie, Katrina, Luther, and so forth. And and apparently that's not really true. Uh, the little evidence that we have uh, suggests that they were they were good friends too. Mm -hmm. And so they they were in this common effort with their husbands. And uh, we don't have too much evidence on the other wives, but for Katharina von Borja, Luther's wife, we know that she was a, a gifted theological thinker uh, in her own right. She had been trained in a, in a, a, nun, a nunnery, a, a nun's a cloister, and uh, she could hold her own in theological debates, at least at at a at a basic level. Mm -hmm. Well, I just find this all interesting that these um, uh, people, well, like like Luther, like you know how he ends up living in the cloister from which he, you know, from his much younger years, he had so many of his struggles that where he struggled with all his doubts and everything, and that he ends up living there as a mature thinker i mean today we're such a mobile people <laughs> and i'm across the country from where i'm from and it's just so um you know and as we move and go on to different places we just that has a certain effect on us uh, it's just so interesting that that luther and these other individuals were uh were in uh, luther was around obviously he traveled around and he was in Erfurt and all that there's different places he's been to but 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 this place, which was so formative in so many ways, ended up um, he 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 ended up being there in other stages of his life as well. So, um, yeah. So you mentioned Kruziger, and this is as another individual in this kind of circle of of um, this this the Luther team, if you want to call it that, the Wittenberg circle. This is the person I perhaps uh, know the least about, or have come across the least. But he sounds um like a really interesting person can you tell us a little bit about about him well not a whole lot drew <laughs> okay <laughs> that's, that's part of the problem that you uh, uh that you're talking about um we don't have many letters we have a lot of letters from Melanchthon, uh, a couple three thousand i've forgotten the exact number we have uh, even more from luther we have uh, a couple volumes from Bugenhagen, one volume from Justus Jonas, um, but we don't have much personal uh, uh, from Kruziger. He didn't publish a whole lot. Uh, there's some discussion about whether his commentary on the Gospel of John, which was taken from his lectures on the Gospel of John, 
is really his work or whether Melanchthon hadn't given him notes to, to lecture on and it's basically Melanchthon's work. I think that uh, Timothy Wingert has pretty much shown that it's it was written by Kruziger okay. himself. Um, but then he died fairly young um, in 1545, so less than a year before Luther, but um, uh, 15 years before Melanchthon, 13 years before uh, uh, before uh, Ugenhagen. Uh, so uh, we we just don't know a whole lot about him. He was involved in a little controversy, again, because he was using Melanchthon's notes in which he uh, had simply taught the students that um, contrition is necessary for salvation. And a couple of uh, Luther's circles thought that sounded too much like uh, something we have to do to earn salvation, and he explained, no, no, it's just that uh, uh, the law will make its effect on you, and, and it's with a contrite heart that you flee to the cross and come to, to faith in Christ. Uh, but uh, we don't know a whole lot about him. Uh, his wife is interesting because uh, she was a hymn writer, a uh, very gifted uh, woman, also like uh, Katharina von Borja, uh, with the, the training that nuns received. Um, uh, but she died quite young as well. The, I, I probably told you in class that um, statistics will show that the, the death rate in 16th century Germany was exactly the same as it looks like it's going to turn out to be in 20th century German. And wow. students always are amazed at that. But there was one death for every birth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people didn't die any oftener in the 16th century. Um, my humor is a little hard to get used to sometimes. <laughs> no, but I, a... I try to make the point that um, we all die. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just the way it is but people did die at a younger age and uh, and so the, the fact that the two crucigers died quite young in their 40s um or elizabeth might have even been just under 40 uh reminds us of how how fragile uh life was in a in a world that wasn't really touched by war until after Luther's death when the armies of Emperor Charles V invaded as they were trying to suppress Lutheranism or the Reformation movement. Um, but but there was plague. Um, there was never a famine in Wittenberg during Luther's lifetime, but there was there, there was scarcity. They, they had some hungry days occasionally uh, in the mm -hmm. 16th century there. Um, so the Crusigers are a good reminder of, of how fragile life really uh, right. was. Well, and it sounds like, um, yeah, it, and it's so hard for the modern mind to wrap around, um, uh, you know, the, the days before mass production and mass farming and, and industrialization. It, just, it was such a different world. Um, yeah. it, it does sound like the, the, the Luther home, the, the former cloister did was a center of hospitality in in certain regards though and and i mean um i, I guess how what, <laughs> what were the the microeconomics at work in like the the luther day-to-day -day family from what you know like the family i mean were they able to because when i read when i like hear about the table talks and I read them i have this mental image that may be off of just like a big like a beer hall in a way just long tables of all these <laughs> friends and associates and there's they're eating and drinking and being merry. It's not all it's about, but they're but that they're doing that. <laughs> but I don't know if that's an accurate picture because you mentioned their scarcity, of course. So, um, and I know Katie Luther was a from what I read was a very hard worker, and Luther is very uh very blessed to have her as a wife because she yeah. she really was a provider in many ways. And so, I mean, I guess is that uh, did did they have what was it like for the um did they struggle i guess the uh, actually uh the the elector wanted 
wanted to draw students to Wittenberg. And so he made sure that Luther and Langton were well paid. Uh, so in that sense, uh, they weren't in need. The trouble with the Luther budget was that Luther loved to give money away. Uh. <laughs> he was not at all re a responsible uh, house father and, and, uh, and, but Katarina was a very good manager. Uh, she'd grown up in a poor family, but a noble family. We think that's impossible, but there were noble families that were were relatively um, poor. And so she had she had learned to be very sharp in her administration of the family budget. Um, so on the cloister grounds, she had a garden and a pigsty and um, I presume chickens and the like, ducks, geese. So uh, she supplied a lot of her own food. She also had inherited a, a, a farm uh, um, in the countryside. I'm not sure how far exactly it was from Wittenberg. Uh, so the, the household could supply uh, a good deal, if not most of its own um, of its own food. Uh, the problem was, of course, when when uh, it didn't rain uh, as much as it should have, or when the frost came too early, then uh, food could be a little scarce. But ag again, she did have as many as 40 uh, people in the house. Uh, her uh, aunt, or, uh, sister of her, her father, uh, lived with them and and helped for a long time uh, to to manage the household, take care of the children, and so forth. Uh, yes, and they would gather um, at the evening meal. I'm not sure what they did at at noon, um, because usually in the 20th century, at least, uh, Germans ate at at noon their their larger meal. Um, but uh, yeah, th so there were large gatherings. And then in that, that 40 people were not only the permanent residents, but but guests who would, would be there for a longer or shorter time. Uh, there was a Danish princess who was married to the, uh, to the count, uh, the elector of Brandenburg, just north of Saxony. And her husband was a, a very strong supporter of the Roman papacy, and she became, uh, like her brother, the king of Denmark, uh, a Lutheran. And uh, he, she feared he was out to kill her. And so she escaped from Brandenburg and came to Wittenberg and lived uh, with uh, the Luthers and was not always in the best of health. So Katarina really had a, uh, a to say a hospital is, is too strong, but she, she had a, uh, uh, occasionally at least people who were ill and and um, so it was quite a quite an enterprise that she mm -hmm. was running wow oh james did you have some i i don't it looked like you were going to say something i'm sorry um well it, so so one of the things or the primary focus so far has been on some of the smaller actors in uh the the life of the reformation and one aspect that to a certain extent gets airtime, but probably deserves a little bit more is who were some of the actors in Wittenberg who were um, who were at least initially supportive of the Reformation, but then started acting um, either towards a more radical reform like Karlstadt or um, or, or others of that category. Could you speak to that? Yeah, Karlstadt, Andreas Bodenstein of Karlstadt uh, is a good example. Uh, he was uh, a little bit older than, than Luther, but they were roughly the same age. And uh, he had at first opposed Luther's crazy ideas about justification by faith. And then he got really excited about reform, and he he went full force into supporting Luther. Um, 
but he probably never really understood what Luther was talking about when he talked about uh, the the word of God, the word of forgiveness as a recreative word that uh, when we trust in it, our whole attitude toward life and toward our own uh, activities changes. Um, throughout the Middle Ages, there were groups that were uh, outsiders. And, and they had, I think, five basic principles. One was the Bible over all the church rules and regulations. But in the Bible, they didn't find uh, the doctrine of justification by faith. Uh, most of them were, were artisans, and so um, very seldom did they have really trained theological leadership. Um, and so they, they were moralistic. They were biblicistic, but they were moralistic. They were salvation by imitating Christ rather than by um, going through all the sacred rituals of the church. Uh, that meant that they rejected uh, the sacraments, um, in part because the sacraments were instruments of power for the clergy, and they were often artisans who, who were uh, asserting their role in a small town uh, in a new way. And then they were all, often um, millenarian as well. They believed that Christ was about to come, often to set up an earthly kingdom under their leadership, um, but not always. Uh, Karlstadt had that understanding of what reform really should look like. And so that's why while Luther was um, in uh, at the Wartburg, uh, he, um, he sort of handed over leadership to, um, to his friend Nicholas von Amsdorf and especially to Philip Melanchthon. But Karlstadt asserted himself. He was the senior member of the faculty, the theological faculty. He had a, a it, was, it was not unnatural for him to say, I'm going to take charge here. And he pushed for a rather radical um, reform. And Luther recognized that that was going to get make trouble for uh, not only individual consciences, but for the Duke's toleration of, of moving away from medieval Christianity as, as people understood it. Um, and so he he opposed Karlstadt, and then he came to realize that Karlstadt's denial of the sacraments as means of the word of God that conveys the promise of forgiveness and actually bestows forgiveness, um, that Karlstadt really had a different spirit. And then Karlstadt rejected the university as a as a godly institution. Uh, he left the university, his, left his professorship, uh, and uh, became a simple Brother Andrew Parish priest, uh, as he called himself. Uh, and so, uh, like all of us, I suppose, Luther didn't take betrayal very kindly. And he saw uh, Karlstadt as somebody who should know better. Uh, he believed that Karlstadt had known better. I'm not sure that Karlstadt had actually, um, but I haven't studied the sources on Karlstadt closely. Uh, and so he he was very sharp in his rejection of Karlstadt. Uh, then in the during the Peasants' Revolt, Karlstadt was suspected as a as a as a revolutionary. I don't think he was, uh, but he had to flee. And Luther gave him cover, actually, in the Black Cloister. He didn't let the elector know that Karlstadt was back. Uh, first of all, he took in Karlstadt's wife because they had been part of the team and friend friends. Um, and, and then Karlstadt himself came to Wittenberg, and for several months, Luther gave him a place, and they kind of reconciled. But then Karlstadt went back to his uh, rejection of the sacraments as as promises of God, and uh, and they broke and, and never really were reconciled. Wow. So, uh, uh, and another example is uh, one of um, Luther's brightest and best students, a man named Johann Agricola, uh, Agricola mm -hmm. got the message that the law is bad. Um, and so he said, well, the law doesn't have anything to do with Christians. It's all gospel. 
But in doing that, the gospel became the thing that that guided our lives. And Luther had a different definition of law and gospel. The law is what describes what we do, and the gospel is what describes what God does for us. And uh, so um, Luther got very angry with Agricola. Actually, he tried to reconcile with him, and, and Agricola said, no, I'll, I, I understand now, and I'll, I'll teach the way you teach. And then he went back to his so-called, wasn't really antinomian, but that's the label he's he's gotten. Well, he so, turned the uh, gospel into the law. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so these are two examples of how Luther uh, could not tolerate people who, who should know better uh, offending consciences in, in Karl Schott's case. Um, well, in both cases, uh, he was really concerned about the pastoral care aspects of the message. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's... Um... You just spoke a little bit about um, what ended up happening um, to to both of these people, uh, Agricola and uh, Karlstadt, um, or what or what became of them. But but so you said you mentioned Karlstadt's at a he's a parish. He ended up finishing his life out as a parish priest, and then um, uh, were were him and Agricola both in? Did they remain in Wittenberg, or were these? Or were, the, were these uh, at other locations where um they, they both finally left Wittenberg. Um okay. I think Karlstadt was probably there for the last time in 1525, maybe early 1526. I'm not sure exactly when he left. But no, he decided that the university wasn't all that bad a place after all and became a professor at the University of Basel. Okay. So he, he in a sense, had his fling, we might say, with a more radical approach and then uh, sort of calmed down and uh, did not did not really come to understand the word of god and its power uh, also in sacramental form as as a conveyor of the promise that it, that remained a stumbling block for him and he mm. didn't become a uh, disciple of luther's again in that sense but he did become a professor and agricola was uh, under I don't think he was under house arrest, but he was under town arrest. He was not to leave town until his dispute with Luther was um, resolved. And he left in the middle of the night and uh, uh, went to uh, Berlin and became the uh, court preacher for uh, the elector of Brandenburg. Uh, his father was the the defender of Roman, uh, the Roman papacy that I mentioned before. His mother was the woman who fled to Wittenberg. And Joachim II, uh, uh, that was the name of the, the son, became uh, a follower of Luther's, and Agricola became his, um, his court preacher. Um, tried to work out a uh, compromise with the Roman Catholics, uh, and boasted that he had made the Roman Catholics Lutherans, uh, which was the opposite was true. He really sacrificed some some of the basic understanding of the doctrine of justification. But he remained till his death, so of a quarter of a century, as a court preacher. So both of them, we might say, landed on their feet, but not within the circle of friendship anymore. Right. Well, it's not, and all these, uh, uh, I'm sorry, James, what were you saying? I was gonna uh I was gonna ask something that probably is gonna branch out and maybe too much. So oh, well, I was, well, I was just gonna say it sounds like the with with uh the case of these of Carl Schott and Agricola, they, they end up leaving Wittenberg and it sounds like Wittenberg has a, a bulwark against the more radical and enthusiastic forms of religiosity um with the with the people who 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 I want to say loyal to Luther, like he's like they're like a mini pope, but like uh, we're on the same page as him um, of, of including some of the individuals we we talked about earlier. Um, but this is all before the the codification, I guess you could say, of Lutheranism. So I guess um, was that that having that that circle, that tight knit group in Wittenberg, um, did that kind of, that I imagine served as the force or set the trajectory for that. Um, yes, 
I, I think that's an important insight. Um, uh, uh, my colleague who's worked on the uh, Book of Concord, this defining set of documents for Lutheranism, uh, contends that you can't really use Lutheran in the sense that we use it today until 1577 or 1580 with the formula of Concord, the Book of Concord, that sort of resolved some of the of the controversies within. And I think that's true, although uh, the term Lutherans used uh, from the 1520s on, especially by Roman Catholics, for whom it was a, an accusation and a condemnation. Uh, but you, you have a, a pretty broad spectrum of people who would have been, who would have considered themselves at least in Luther's orbit, maybe not dependent on Luther, but um, but within uh, the, the same movement. And, and you have then a, a serious split in the 1520s with um, Ulrich Zwingli and Johannes Euclampadius in Basel and Karlstadt uh, over the sacraments uh, and and so on and so forth. And that remains the major point of contention, I suppose. Uh, but but there is a kind of refining and a development of precisely what what we mean or what Luther and Melanchthon meant, we might say. And um, and that goes on really un, until the 1570s, until 1580. Mm hmm. James, what was your your uh, wild question you were gonna? Well, it's it's probably not that <laughs> wild, <clears throat> but branching out slightly from Wittenberg, um, one person who is within the Anglican orbit that is oops sorry that is related to um, Luther and also was someone who had um, fairly significant disagreement with Luther is Andreas Osiander, who was. You know, his niece married Thomas Cranmer, um, mm -hmm. and uh, Osiander has become kind of a uh, divisive name within Lutheranism, especially since people like Tuoma Monoma in Finland say that Luther and Osiander are actually closer together than Luther and confessional Lutheranism. So what, what could you offer about that? Um, well, Tuoma was... <laughs> was a friend of mine and and I have a number of good friends in in his circle. Well they're just wrong. <laughs> so I'm um, actually the, the book that I'm I'm just finishing up now is in part a discussion and exchange with with um not really on the point uh that that's a, a sort of somewhat similar to Osiander. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I think I'm very grateful to, to Tuomo Manama because he, he really made us look at the doctrine of justification again. And it's been a, a, a really very change. Uh, and it's interesting. I just reviewed a book by one of actually his intellectual grandchildren, the student of one of his students. Um, in which he doesn't talk about theosis, that is justification as divinization, mm -hmm. um, but as participation in Christ. Um, I don't think he defines participation adequately, but but at least um, he's he's showing that these discussions go on and they can go on for a couple generations. Sure. Um, Osiander had studied under the great humanist master of Hebrew, uh, Johann Reuchlin, who was, who was a, a, also a, a supporter of Melanchthon, but who broke with Melanchthon. Um, they, 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 it, it sometimes said he was Melanchthon's great uncle. They, they, they were not blood related, but they had relatives in common. Uh, but uh, Reuchlin took a, a great interest in Melanchthon until he followed Luther, and then Reuchlin was faithful to the old church and, and uh, broke with Melanchthon. But he had been influenced by the medieval Jewish interpretation of scripture according to the Kabbalah. We've had in the last 40 years or so a revival of the Kabbalah. Yeah, that's the Madonna um, religion. 
<laughs> yeah. That's the first yeah. person I thought of. <laughs> or she yeah. wasn't to that for some time. I don't know if that's still the case. But. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know either, but um, but uh, so Osiander had this basically uh, it's a, a Jewish way of interpretation that is very allegorical, mm -hmm. um, discounted the, the the literal level of scripture, not totally, uh, but said that the, the truths are found beyond it, but they were found in what was essentially uh, a system that followed uh, the Greek philosophers uh, that we call Neoplatonic, the followers of, of, of Plato, which was a very spiritualizing approach to scripture. Uh, so Osiander was an Augustinian. He studied with Reuchlin and then came to Nuremberg, which was a hotbed of Luther supporters. Uh, Melanchthon was very popular there. Uh, Luther came occasionally to talk with the leading humanists. Um, a very interesting collection of people in Nuremberg. Actually, you could call them part of uh, another team that was very supportive of Luther. Um, and Osiander basically uh, caught a lot of Luther's uh, vocabulary, talked about justification, talked about faith. But underlying it, he said, well, the word human language is simply not capable of of really accomplishing anything. It's all up in heaven uh, where things are accomplished. And so while he didn't talk about the, the theosis or the divinization of uh, the human being, he, as Tuomo Manama did, he did talk about what makes us righteous. And it's not God's looking at us with his favor and pronouncing us with a recreative word that has power to to recreate us as God's children, but um, but rather that the divine nature of Christ comes to dwell in the believer through faith. Um, Osiander's definitions and his theology, I think, are a little bit um, a little bit unclear. That's why for so long no one really took seriously the differences. Um, but finally, after Luther's death, he and Melanchthon got into a very, very serious literary exchange that was ended within a year or two by Osiander's death, although the, the debate continued to go on. Mm -hmm. He had almost no supporters. Uh, I've mentioned Timothy Wingert. You mentioned Timothy Wingert before. He's written a book called Defending Faith, in which he shows that almost everyone associated with Wittenberg in one way or another, uh, opposed um, Osiander. Mm -hmm. um, and they opposed him for a number of reasons. For one thing, uh, Luther insisted that the divine and human natures in Christ can't be separated. And Osiander was essentially saying the human nature isn't so important. The divine nature is what's really important. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, he was accused, at least, of not having a... a a sufficiently strong concept of sin to make the atonement through Christ's death and resurrection uh, an important part of his message. And it is true that that uh, while he mentioned the death and resurrection of Christ, of course, uh, the coming through faith to uh, of Christ's divine nature to dwell in us. Uh, doesn't essentially need an atonement as as Luther's understanding of sin certainly did. Um, and there were some other issues as well. So Osiander is one of those kind of tragic figures. He was forced out of Nuremberg when Emperor Charles V was trying to reconvert Lutheran areas to Roman Catholicism. And he fled to uh, Kingsberg and probably he, the, the, the Duke, Duke Albrecht of Prussia, um, had been converted by Osiander's preaching. And so he uh, gave Osiander all sorts of privileges. And of course, all the Wittenberg people there um, were offended by this intruder, and especially when he started to teach things that they recognized were contrary to what Luther had said. But I don't think Osiander ever was in Wittenberg, but he certainly met Luther a number of times, and uh, they were kindly disposed toward each other. Um, 
but I don't think Osiander really did understand Luther very well. And of mm. course, Tuomo Manuma and and his people insist that uh, that they are not Osiandrians. So mm -hmm. I uh, I remember being in Helsinki once and being asked that, uh, not so directly, but indirectly, of what I thought of Osiander, and I. I didn't really fully catch that that was a question of what I thought of Tuomo. So oh, it was a litmus <laughs> <Yeah>. test. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Well, it sounds like to me, the underlying uh, Oceano kind of, he confuses me a little bit. Like the under, what underlies it, I think is that you mentioned this platonic influence and how he, uh, and how and you described him as a spiritualist. And, and yeah. so it seems like um, the immaterial, and the the you know the transcendent otherness of of divinity and holiness is is um is the is the ultimate ends here and it's yeah. you know perhaps uh somewhere we as people need to get to i'm not trying to put thoughts and words in his mouth but it it does sound very different from from luther who who recognizes the 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 loneliness and the of humanity and matter but that god does something for the lowly human yeah um, if yeah i don't know if that's a good way to describe the contrast or to dig deeper into that but it, it, it is i think um luther was very down to earth uh i think it was because uh he was a uh, he had been taught by people who were followers of william of Ockham in the 14th century and william of Ockham. Um, emphasized, for one thing, God's sovereignty, his almightiness, uh, uh, and then also emphasized the, the goodness of creation. And uh, Luther picked up on that goodness of creation theme and uh, embraced it fully so that his, his faith is one that doesn't try to reach into the heavens, but looks to the cross and the empty tomb in the midst of human life and and stresses our our concept uh, or his concept calvin's concept of the christian's calling in daily life so that the christian life is really lived out in human community uh, for luther uh, as well as for calvin um in in service to god uh, on the basis of being able to trust jesus christ as the one who gives us our new identity as children of god so uh we're we're Pretty much at time, but I did. I, I know you. You mentioned, um, and we never got to him. And when we were talking a while ago about um, whether Luther perhaps ate well or not, a lot of the pictures I see of him, um, he. I don't want to say he, overweight or obese. That, but but he looks. Uh, I don't know, stocky, in a lot of. Uh, Corpulent. What's that, James? <laughs> Corpulent. There you go. That's <laughs> yeah. a very elegant way yeah. of putting and um and i i don't know i i don't know if it's if the those paintings are accurate or if they were made if they were perhaps a little bit propagandic to make him look um um mighty i don't know like a kind of a big guy but but uh the painter of of at least some of them if not majority of them a lot of the paintings we see of of luther from luther's time are from lucas cranach um and there were two of them can you um, tell us a little bit about the Lucas's beef um, for the, I guess, the conclusion of our episode? Yeah, uh, Cranach was a very, very important person in Luther's life. They were very close friends, and um, Cranach uh, uh, supported him with his artwork um, and also uh, with a printing operation. And uh, so uh, he's a very important part of the of the Wittenberg team. His first um, woodcuts uh, of Luther show a pretty um, pretty thin uh, ascetic monk, uh, bro uh, Augustinian brother. Uh, around fifteen twenty, he was not uh, uh, well fed. Uh, then he got married, and uh, the the pictures take on a little bit more of a 
good German frame. Cranach also uh, depicted his father and his mother. His mother was was quite thin, uh, but his father was well built, bodily gifted, uh, we could say. And uh, <laughs> so, but nobody was concerned in the 16th century about being overweight. It was not not a problem. And uh, when we look, for instance, at Thomas Aquinas, his pictures, he was a he was a very corpulent um, Dominican brother. Uh, so I think the the pictures are probably pretty as accurate as as uh, portraits get in in showing him as a as a man whose wife could cook. <laughs> let's say um and and that's just what aging does to people i suppose you could say um i was always chubby so uh, in my case it doesn't count but um uh, yeah and i think you see when you know about the relationship you see a little bit of of the glow of the friendship in the way that Cranach. Uh, depicts him. Cranach, of course, never painted alone. He had probably several dozen apprentices in his shop. That was a major production uh, center for uh, for art. Uh, and he served Roman Catholic princes uh, and bishops as well. But I think you you see something uh, of of their relationship reflected in the way that that Cranach depicted the whole family. Mm hmm. Yeah, I um, and of course, I always like the the painting of bearded Luther when he gets back from Wartburg. Yeah, Castle. I see those beards today. They were, he was a bit ahead of his time. And yes. Regard, yeah. So, yeah. Well, uh, any closing thoughts before we uh, wrap this episode up from Dr. Cole I, from we we we've talked about Luther as a member of a team. He was certainly the captain. Um, Melanchthon fed a lot of ideas into Luther's head, as well as Luther feeding them into Melanchthon's head. But the others were probably generally dependent on the two of them. Um, but they had different tasks. We haven't talked about Justice Jonas, but he did a lot of translation of of the works of both of them from Latin into German or from German into Latin, and was a professor uh, also. And uh, and so I think it's important to remember uh, in the work of the church, as in all human relationships, God didn't create us to be alone. And uh, this principle of teamwork is is vital for the way that the Holy Spirit works within the church and, and human life works in general. Cool. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Dr. Kolb. Uh, this is a great discussion. Um, I learned a lot. And I like the, you know, I like all the episodes I do, but I especially like the ones um, coming in with with not a, a lot of knowledge about um, the, whether the a topic or a person, because it's always it's always just fun to learn. And so, um, James, thank you also for coming on. Yep. And uh, listeners, will uh, we appreciate you tuning in? And uh, God bless, and I look forward to uh, y'all coming back for our next episode.